Hey, this is Dave Turns from Gold Rush, and you're listening to Blacktop Banter. This episode of Blacktop Banter is brought to you by Craftco, the world's leading manufacturer of packaged pavement preservation materials and equipment for the asphalt industry. Learn more at craftco.com. What's up, everybody? Marvin here at Blacktop Banter. We have Dave Turin joining us today. Uh, I believe he's back in Oregon in between filming and uh, we didn't get a chance to run into each other at Con Expo this last year, but uh, we're going to be meeting up really soon, and we'll get into that a little bit. But, Dave, for people who don't know who you are, give us a little bit of a brief description, and then uh, t- talk to us a little bit about getting into the construction world and, and how that all came about. Well, thanks for having me on your podcast. I appreciate it. I always try to get the word out to people. A um, little bit about me. Uh, I've been in... I'm 64. Uh, we started paving driveways and uh, when I was 12. Oh, so crazy. what is that? 52 years? Yeah, you got 50, more experience than I do for sure. Yeah, 52 <laughs> years of uh, paving. Um, again, my dad was a, a high school football coach and a teacher. And uh, in the late 70s, he got kind of tired of uh kids and the way the education for sure. was going so he and he had paved in the summertime going to college okay. so he had four boys and so he's already got a crew i was 12 my my younger brother was 10 my oldest brother was 15 and so we actually paved our own driveway to start with and then the neighbor saw that and said hey could you pave mine and then that neighbor saw that neighbor and Get said could you pave mine and off we went. How, and, how, did you, uh, how did you guys pave them right away? Like, were, did your dad buy a paver right away? Did we use a spreader box? Like, no. what was the first? Where we did uh, it by hand? Shovel and rake, buddy. Ooh. Our first, our first roller was a lawn roller. Perfect, perfect. That's a, not... that, that hit. I know that hit compaction ratings for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> no, no, there weren't any compaction specs on our own driveway, so for sure. But you know what? That thing lasted. I think it lasted. I don't know. We ended up repaving it, For but, sure. uh, yeah, but what it did was, uh, and then we just grew and we grew, you know, we went from that to, uh, a spreader box on the back of a truck yep. and then started paving, you know, roads and driveways and crazy. We were doing highways. Um, we ended up buying a rock quarry and asphalt plant, um, all those kind of things. And so I went to school uh, <clears throat> studied engineering. I got an engineering degree and I remember my wife, uh, at the time. So I was, I had to go back to night school. My wife's a nurse. I quit college, let her get through nurses training. Then I went back to school, but at the end I had three kids yep. graduate with an engineering degree. I packed the kids up in the old Buick station wagon with the wood paneling on the back yep. around on the side. And I went looking for a job. And uh, I'll never forget, my wife looked at me. She goes, what's an engineer do? And I said, well, they sit in an office and they design things. And she goes, you can't sit in an office. <laughs> was, yeah. But what happened is I, I, went, I went across, you know, the West Coast looking for a job. And about that time, we had an asphalt plant in a rock quarry. The people that owned the rock quarry were going bankrupt. We buy it out of bankruptcy. I go into... Uh, I told the brothers and dad, I said, look, I'll, I'll run that aspect and manage it yep. if uh, we buy it. And at the time, dad always included us. We, we were owners. I mean, I'm 20, 25 years old when we buy the asphalt plant. And when we bought our, no, I'm 20, 28 when we bought the rock quarry. Yep. I was like, 20 when we bought the asphalt plant okay. but dad always made us an owner yeah that, ge- that so gave you the ambition young, right like that yeah that, when you had from a state very man. young age i was always an owner yeah <laughs> thinking about that and so we bought thinking about that in reflection uh my son eli who's doing line striping and stuff for us in the asphalt business he's 12 and like he, w- when he knows that he's got a piece of it when it's coming like you his whole demeanor changes about it, right so he yeah. he got into it kind of the same age you did he got raised on blacktop as we say and like it, it, even now like he's thinking about the future like he wants to go to the shows he wants to learn he wants to do all the conference stuff because he wants a stake in whatever it is going for so that 
mentality, of course, makes a big difference, as you've come to find out for sure. And that's common in generational asphalt industries within our industry. Well, I really respect that you're bringing your son up. I think uh, a lot of young people don't know, you know, how to work. Mm -hmm. I think um, I'm going to want to get into it, but I think sometimes parents try to protect our kids too much. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of hard work is good Mm -hmm. to learn how to work. For instance, <clears throat> my grandson now is 14. Um, he's six foot tall, about 165 pounds, a big kid. Yeah. But from the time he was probably five, we've always had him on our claims wherever we went. Okay. And uh, I just had him filming with me, and uh, he loves it. Year before last, he was in Alaska with us, and he worked with us for about three, four weeks yep. and loved it and made, made a lot of money. And he's like, dang, this is pretty fun making money in Alaska, <laughs> yep. playing in a river. Yeah. Yeah. And he loved it. Cool. I love, he loved it. And that's what we need to do. I think we need to raise up, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Allow their kids to work. Yep. I agree with you. I, you know, it's always been that mentality is I want my kids to have better than I had it. Well, what if, yeah. what if you had it really, really, really good and you didn't know it, right? Like yeah. for me, right. I was working since I was 12, uh, did roofing, and then transitioned into this. And I wouldn't change it for anything. That's where my work ethic comes from. I enjoy it like during the day. And I can see it, right, on, on your end, your grandson's side and uh, or your nephew's side and like in my kid's side where it's like they lo- – like. Eli loves it. He loves the life of it and understanding that all he has to do is work hard and he's going to have more than what 90% of the kids his age are probably going to have because he has to work for it. We can provide it for him, but I don't. I'm like, if you want it, you got to work for it, right? And I think that's the major key that I see in people that succeed nowadays, right? We're we're working with Build Wit. You are, I am here on the um, Dirt World Summit coming up and we know that Aaron and his team (laughs) That's our big thing is let's make this industry cool. Let's make it interesting so that the people who are younger understand you can create a great life within this industry. And it leads to some pretty cool stuff. I mean, to be honest with you, you know, we can kind of transition into that some. I don't imagine when you had the asphalt plant in uh, for however long you did it. uh, I'll have to ask you that for sure. How long asphalt was the major game? But. I don't ever imagine that you imagine that it would lead to mining for gold on TV in Alaska, right? When you were on that <laughs> no, machine, same, never. same thing on never. our end. Like I never realized, I didn't ever imagine we would be at Indy car races and NASCAR races talking about what the pavement condition is for the races coming yeah. up and talking to the yeah. likes of you and everybody else. <clears throat> but you never know. The opportunities are so vast. So can you yeah. can we kind of I'll, I'll, I'll ask a two sided question. How long was the asphalt side like the major part of, of what your life was, you think, running the pavers, running the asphalt plants, getting the rock, mixing um, all that stuff to where it transitioned to the mining gold rush like that side? Like what? what did yeah. That so like? it was. Yeah, it was probably. 40, 42 years, probably yeah. wow, 42 years was, yeah, that was the primary business. Um, let me give you, I was thinking of something real quick though, Yep. about, about kids raising them up yep. in the family business. Here's a trick that my brothers and I found out because all of our kids, all my nieces and nephews, we always included them. And, uh, the majority of them went to college, but it gave them an opportunity to help pay for their college. Mm-hmm. If they're invested in their college, they're also invested in grades and making, you know, being yeah. successful. Yeah. But one thing we found was as an uncle, I was a better boss to my nephews than dad was mm-hmm. because dad is like, like, just like my son, he'd be like, dad, I got to go to a basketball game or a baseball game. All right. You know, what time's the game? Well, it's at four and I want off at noon. I'm like, hold on now. Well, you know, but as a dad, you're like, you listen to him. But as an uncle, you're like, no, yeah. you're going to leave at quarter till. And then you <laughs> go to the baseball game. <clears throat> so that was something that we learned um, that the uncles were a little bit harder on on the uh, nephews and the nieces. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, so what my 
our business. So, you know, we weren't, we weren't a huge company. Mm -hmm. However, we were pretty successful. We had, there was four brothers running it. We had bought mom and dad out. Gosh, when 20 years ago, um, and we had a rock quarry, we were producing rock asphalt, building roads. Um, and it was, it was a great business, but for me, after doing that job, running that rock quarry for 30 some years, I felt like anybody could do that job. I'm always looking for a challenge. I'm the guy that was always pushing the envelope. I was always, and we tried buying and starting new quarries and for whatever reason they just kept uh money or the the financing or you know how to set it up yeah and so we i was stuck in one place now i thought i was a really good miner Mm -hmm. but i knew how to mine one quarry in one state and because of that uh problem solving um i love i love to figure things out yep Todd Hoffman came to me who started gold rush. It was his idea. And he's from my hometown here. And he came to me and he said, Hey, I'm going to go to Alaska and I'm going to take some friends and I got some equipment. Would you look at it? Tell me what you think. So I look at it and I was like, man, dude, this is not good. You got a bunch of junk. (laughs) And so I help him and try to teach him what pumps are like. Um, We wired up his first generator and all the switch gear um we showed him how to screen rock we showed him how to move dirt and i was just helping a brother out right i was right. like all right i'll help this guy out. and along the way he goes i'm gonna do a tv show and i'm like you bet your pal sure. good luck on that yep <laughs> and so i thought it was the craziest idea he comes back in uh about a month later and he goes hey we're loading up to go to alaska would you come help us load up and this is 14 years ago yeah and uh i said sure i show up and there's producers and cameras and sound guys. And I'm like, oh, oh it's legit. Damn, he pulled it yeah, off. Yeah, it's legit. He really it did it. Legit, man. I was like, he pulled it off. So that was season one. They brought me up. Uh, season one, I, I got their wash plant started in July. Woohoo, everybody's going. And then they brought me back up in September. And for me, you know, you think about the enticements as a man. Um, I'm, I'm restless anyway. I thought anybody could do my job at the home quarry, Mm -hmm. but you think about it, Alaska. Oh yeah. Gold. Oh yeah. And TV. Oh yeah. I'm like, that's adventure. So the first year I did it. Yeah. It was an adventure. I did it all on my own dime season two. I went and split half the time Mm -hmm. and then season three, um, they made me an offer and I said, thanks for the opportunity, but I'll see you later. Yeah. Cause I had, you know, you own your own business. Yeah. you know, if you do it right, you're making some good money. And yep. and we were in business for 30, 35 years. So it's going good. And I said, look, thanks for the adventure. Thanks for the experience. But if I'm not making more money, I'm out of here. Yeah. So then that's when I started on Gold Rush. And then. Uh, yeah, that seems to be. The rest is history. That seems to always be like, at least for us anyways, that was the negotiator too. Right. Like I love doing Blacktop Banner. I love showing our industry. I love all the good things we do. We have some great sponsors now. And when I first started, it was just a, a passion project, right? Like, dude, I want to show all yeah. these cool people in our industry that have the cool stories that I really enjoy. There's got to be other people that enjoy them. And then it got to the point of like, okay, this is like a major commitment. Like, if I'm going to do this yeah. at this level, it's a major commitment. And that means it's taking time away from my business and scaling my businesses the way that I could on the asphalt side. I need to get paid for this. And like, that's where all of a sudden we're like, okay, if we're going to do this, we have to ask sponsors for X amount and we, uh, we have to offer advertising and whatnot to our audiences. Thankfully we have larger audiences now within the the industry that make that happen. But it's a, it's a weird transition. It's really cool to hear your side of it too. Right. Where like a lot of things nowadays, people want it now, right? This, this, this this instant gratification society we live in, but yet here, your story is, I, I did this for this long, for this amount of time. I had an expertise in the construction industry, and an opportunity showed up and happened. And now, like you said, 14 years ago, man, that's crazy to think it's that much time has passed since the first season. That many times. Yeah, yeah, that here you've been able to do this amazing adventure within the construction space just by doing what you've done and did for years and made your your career. So 
When we come back, I want to pick your brain a little bit about some of the um, experiences that you've learned from being on the TV side of it and everything. But real quick, we're going to jump to a commercial break for some of our sponsors who bring this podcast and all of our podcasts to you. So once we get back, we're going to ask Dave some questions about the TV side of everything he does. Asphalt maintenance contractors. Winter's just around the corner, and we all know the harmful effects that colder months have on pavement. Here at Wiscoat, we've tried a lot of products. We keep coming back to Craftco because of their crack and joint sealers are the best in the industry. No matter the climate that you're located in, Craftco has products that will fit your needs. Find the full product lineup at craftco.com. That's C R A F C O.com. Have you seen the smoothness and compaction that Dynapack Seismic Technology has recently brought to the asphalt industry? It's incredible. And Dynapack's CC900G roller may just be the best roller on the market for driveway and parking lot paving contractors. It's even better than the little yellow one that you're used to seeing. But don't take my word for it. Give the CC900G a test run yourself by visiting Dynapack.com and finding a retailer near you. Say goodbye to potholes and roadway damage without the need for large crews, heavy equipment, or toxic chemicals. Aquafault is the only permanent repair material for asphalt and concrete that uses water. And installation is simple. Just pour, add water, and tamp. It's that easy. An Aquafault repair can be opened to traffic immediately and fully sealed within 24 hours. Plus, the product is backed by a three-year warranty and is made in the USA. Visit Aquafault.com. That's A-Q-U-A-P-H-A-L-T dot com to learn more. I'm incredibly proud of the Blacktop Banner Edition seal coating unit produced in partnership with KM International and available now in both the 550 and 700 gallon versions. Custom built on the same frame as their bulletproof hot boxes, I work closely with KM to design what I believe is the best seal coating unit on the market. A unit designed by a contractor for contractors. See the entire walkthrough of the unit on Blacktop Banner's YouTube channel or visit kminternational.com to learn more and place your order. Since its inception, Dubuque Asphalt Maintenance has branded our trucks with the 1-800 blacktop number from the 800 Paven Network and consistently seen increases in leads and jobs completed. I know the 800 Paven Network can do the same for your business. Visit 1-800-pavement.com and get set up with your custom phone number today. All right, so we're back with Dave Turin. Dave my my question that I kind of alluded to before the commercial break was um, the TV side of it, right? Like that's something that w- we know that our followers, listeners, and people who we interact with do plenty of paving. They do plenty of the construction side. They do plenty of mining. I'm going to guess that the TV experience on our side of the industry is pretty minimal <laughs> by people. So what can you tell us you learned most from the TV experience now that you've been doing it this long, it's been 14 years. Um, I, I think that people in our industry have a pretty good perception of the world from the construction side, but you've been able to see it from a different side and, and both and our side as well. What did you learn most from gold rush and, and all the, the spinoffs and, and your own, which we did, which we enjoy as well. Like over all these years, what's the overall thing that you've learned most? Well, I think, there's a couple things. Uh, number one, I would, I never aspired to be a TV person. Um, but what I did was, um, I knew that if I got on gold rush, um, cause I thought it was a dumb idea. Mm-hmm. I thought it was going to be one season. I really did. I thought who in the world would watch a bunch of dudes mining. I thought it's <laughs> stupid, but it was a great adventure. And, and so my advice is, you know, sometimes there's an opportunity in front of you, right? And I thought it was a dumb idea, but I thought, well, let's let's check it out. Yep. So I've always been a guy, I'll, I'll walk down that path until that path either has a closed door <clears throat> or something tells me to go another path. And a lot of times, um, <clears throat> you know, that path is one of the paths that are least traveled by. For sure. But I, I go down the path and then try to figure it out. And, uh, so I, I go down gold rush and I, you know, I'm like, I'd never aspired to this, but I figured out real quick that the one way I'm going to survive, cause I'm not, look, I'm not a, that good looking. I'm not, you know, 
No, but I'm, I'm serious. I'm like, how, how am I going to, and it wasn't my idea. Right. My one thing was I'm going to work my ass off. I'm going to work harder than anybody else. And my dad taught me that yeah. <clears throat> on the paving crew. Cause I was always the young guy yep. and dad made me the boss and I've got older guys working for me. Well, the one thing I could do is work harder than anybody else. Yep. So I get on gold rush. I work my ass off and I think to myself, if I'm going to survive, I'm going to bust my ass to find as much gold as I could. Mm -hmm. Now that, that conflicted with the camera because the camera would be like, Hey, stop. Uh, we want to do that again. I'm like, Nope, I'm going to get the gold. So what that created though, is I had the action moving yeah. around me. There was another guy that liked to yep. do the TV, but it was right. stationary. He'd stand there and, and I'm moving. I'm like moving. All right, you guys go here. We're going to do this. This is what's going on. This is how we're going to do it. Yep. And I was constantly in motion. And that's the one thing that I told. And even with the guys coming on my crew, I said, look, the one thing that's going to, you're going to survive on this show. And I can't speak to other shows, but if we work our ass off, find as much gold as we can, you know, that's, that's how we're going to survive. And so that's, that's what I did. And I think, um, it always comes down to that, right? You know, if, Hard work. I think it, like it, it always comes right? back if, to, if you want to win, no matter what aspect of it, you don't got to win by miles, but if you want to win, hard work usually does it. Talent will help you get so far. This will help you get so far. Being good looking helps you right. get so far. But if you get, if you're the hardest worker in the room or in the outside, you're going to win in some regard, no matter what. I'll tell yeah. you what, yeah. what, what hits me right away, right? Yeah. When you say that, because uh, my wife has watched every single Gold Rush episode. I frequently, I haven't, but by osmosis and being around. Uh, I don't. I don't watch a whole lot of TV, but by being around, I'll finally tell your wife I love her. By the way, and be like, "Oh, Dave loves Kelly. Fantastic." <laughs> the the thing that that I always right. The, so there's two things on the show. Everybody wants to know how much gold you got at the end of the at the end of the week when we do the payouts, yeah. and yeah. we love when the screens break and when the belts break and when the hoses break and like you don't love it, but that's what creates the drama. Is like, oh shit, they had a goal to hit. And now the belt's down, the dozer's down, whatever's down, and we ain't going to do it. If you work hard, you're going to break shit, first and foremost. Like you're going to work the equipment. It's going to yeah. break. So you're going yeah. you're to create the action. <laughs> you're going to create the action and drama. But then secondly, if it gets back up and going and you're still working hard, you're probably going to output a decent amount of gold of what you're going to try to do. I think that was the best mentality you could yeah. have had, right, when it comes to that. But you had two, you had two points. Yeah. One was work your ass off. What was the other one? Oh, just choose the path. There, if there's an opportunity, don't always look at that opportunity and go, oh, that ain't going to work out. Because if I just said, oh, that's a stupid idea, Gold Rush will never make it, I would have been sitting in my rock quarry at home and missed the amazing opportunities that TV has given me. It's allowed me to meet so many people, travel the world. Mm -hmm. And had I gone, oh, well, that's a dumb idea, instead of going, Okay, that's a dumb idea, but I'm going to look into it. I'm going to walk that path until, you know, something yep. changes. And so, yeah, it's like work your ass off. I want to say real quick, there was, I don't yeah, know you if can you say can whatever say you this, want. but I was watching it. Like, I like football, and uh, there was a there was an after-game uh, interview with Lamar Jackson yep. from the Ravens. And this is when he was young. And they asked him, and he had a shirt on that said, it's real plain stuff. He had a shirt on it said shut up and play harder and I was that's like, the best that is so good <laughs> and and the the announcer or the uh guy doing the interview says hey you know uh why didn't you make this play here and he goes yep and he says read the shirt it says shut up and play harder so he didn't say anything and he goes so the interviewer goes well you know one of your guys missed the block you got blindsided on the backside and he goes, what do you think? And he goes, yep. read yeah. the shirt. <laughs> it said, shut up and yep. play harder. You know, if people would shut up and play harder, do their jobs, I think, anyway, that's yeah, just it, my it, mentality. It's not like, so Lamar Jackson wins MVP, right, um, one year. Like, it, yep. I guarantee, he didn't complete every pass, right? And, and he didn't throw zero right. interceptions. But he outworked everybody, yeah. right, to make it click and make it work. And that's, yep. I think that's what it takes. Yeah. So, it, you yeah. know, I, I, 
I love your message and, and what you put out. We we reviewed some po- podcasts that you had done beforehand before we got here and stuff. Um, you and I are going to be at Dirt World Summit coming up the end of October here. This podcast will air early October, so people are going to look forward to seeing you speak there. Um, we have another great lineup of speakers. We're going to be there capturing content, doing content, and show promotion for Dirt World and whatnot. It's been great to work with Build Wit on our end. Yeah, so Dirt World Summit, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's it's an amazing idea. Aaron Witt, um, I think, is transforming our industry. We're designing an event to capitalize upon what I think the industry desperately wants. If we can go help create the next generation of leadership in the dirt world, that's how you go change an industry. That's how you go bring this industry to that, that next generation. So that's what we're focused on now. Because there is such a desire to come together and learn and grow as the industry. Our main course is going to be developing yourself as a leader, developing yourself as a human being, and connecting with people. There isn't anything like that right now. There's a desire for it. And so that's what we're working on for this fall called the Dirt World Summit, dirtworld.com. And I've known Aaron for, gosh, since he got out of college. He met me at a, I think it was a World of Asphalt yeah. event. I did, a, I did a talk on it and he came up to me afterwards and he, we talked and, and we started to say, Hey, I'd love to, you know, and he had some ideas and I said, yeah, I'd love to collaborate and help you out. And so we've done, you know, a number of things I've talked to with him about probably three different times. And what I love about Aaron is he brings such perspective for a young man. And then I bring perspective, you know, as somebody that's been in the business and we can yes. go back and forth because I can speak to my generation. He can speak to his generation. You know, we can talk about, you know, what my generation is like. And but I can also talk to, you know, the younger generation because Aaron's right there. And anyway, it's a great. You were you uh, were young. You were young once, Dave. Yeah, I so, was. Yes, so sir. so you, you have a perspective <laughs> from that side, too. And, and on our end. Uh, I'm 38. Aaron's younger than me. Uh, we we think about the future and what that looks like, right? And what our careers will look like near the end of it. So it's great. It's a great yin yeah. and yang, and I think it's very important. I think it's yeah. important for both sides going forward. Yeah, and I think I get I get mad at my generation, the old guys there, and inevitably when I speak, I get the old guy yep. in the back, right? And he stands up and he goes, hey, I'm just tired of these young people. They don't know yeah. how to work. And I'm like, dude, you need to teach them how to work. No, nah, they're just, I said, stop. It's my responsibility. It's your responsibility to pass on our knowledge and our wisdom and our experience and train up the young guys. I said, don't, don't have a close mind. Because I said, I'll bet your dad told you you weren't going to amount to anything. And I said, I'll bet you his dad told your dad that he ain't gonna amount to anything because i said i know my dad said i'll never amount to anything and i said look at me and i used to think about my son who's now a an optometrist has three clinics when he was in middle school i'm like you didn't see that coming is this kid ever gonna be anything (laughs) sorry for the pun but yeah and now he's yeah he's very very successful so um yeah and so at dirt world though i want to talk about our Mm -hmm. image as an industry, because as I travel around the United States and I see, I see mines or I see job sites or I see, you know, people's Mm -hmm. yards, um, even their business, the front of their business, I feel like we're not, we're not getting our best foot forward because guys like you and Aaron are doing it on social media, right? You're getting the word out. We're making this industry cool. I love that. But it's also our responsibility here yeah. at home. Our companies need to be in the newspapers. If we get an award for um, if we get an award for the best operator in our state, it, it should be either on the news or it should be in the newspaper. It should be on the community yeah. website. Um, things like that. We need to celebrate the successes because trust me. The other people, you know, that don't like us out there, they're going to show every mistake we make. But if we can bombard them with the success stories, the people that are doing it right, 
then we got a chance to survive because mining is I'm becoming a prehistoric animal, a miner yeah. in Oregon. I'm telling you, man, yeah. it's not easy. Yeah, I think you I think you hit the nail on the head. It's you know, people are like, well, you know, are you guys doing it because you want to be perceived a certain way? It's like, no, we we do what we do to highlight who we are and how we are. Like we're not we, we're not putting on a facade. Right. Like this is just us ex- showing that you know, we are professional. We are we do give back. We do strive for excellence, right? And that's because we want to make sure what we do when, and what you do uh, on the mining side, we create roads that get people from point A to point B. They wouldn't even be able to get to where they're going to be to pick up the newspaper if it wasn't for people mining, putting blacktop down, and making sure the compaction ratings are way better yep. than a lawn roller at this point, for sure. <laughs> um, so we're going to see you at Dirt World. Are you going to be at World of Asphalt coming up again? That's going to be coming up in March. We'll be there. We'll have a booth. We'd love to have you stop by there if you got time. I'm, you made it once. I don't know what the Dave Turner schedule looks like nowadays. I'm sure it looks like mine, and it's it's all over yeah. and doing. But we're, is that where we can find you is at Dirt World? world where else do you do you have anything on the calendar uh i'll be at dirt world um not right now i haven't been asked to go to world of asphalt uh we'll, we'll see what we can do i'd love I, i'd love to have you there it's in nashville again yeah. so go to we'll get that done oh we'll i love nashville booth. maybe maybe we'll have a segment okay. and then i'll buy the first round at tootsie's whether it's na or whatever it is we'll make it happen it's on me i like it perfect all right um, all right no, I love I love Nashville. I love World of Asphalt. I think it's a great yeah. thing. So, um, I'll try to get that, that on my schedule. Perfect. That sounds perfect. Okay, um, you know, you did, you gave us some great piece of advice. This is usually where um, you know I ask questions for a great piece of advice, but you did great when it comes to that all the way through. So we'll highlight those and put those out for people to see for sure. And I I would like to ask about family and what the future looks like. Um, that'll probably be the last question I ask you here on the show today. Um, we can find you online. I know for sure on Instagram, uh, I, I, you and I connected on LinkedIn, which is fantastic. Dude, LinkedIn is just crazy, crazy to me how yeah. advantageous it is for social media side, for sure. We can yeah. find all your shows, Facebook pages and whatnot, um, on there and stuff as well. But I think the last piece of advice that, that, or, or not even advice, just the last question I have for you, Dave, um, you alluded to the fact that you're 64, you've had this career. Um, what does the future look like for Dave Turin? I mean, do you do you hang it up, or do you have that old construction side of you that doesn't ever want to hang it up? Um, what, what does it look like for Dave Turin? <laughs> okay, so yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it's so. Anyway, I got off. My show was called Dave mm-hmm. Turns Lost Mine, and mm-hmm. we—I'll be honest with mm-hmm. you—got canceled, and that was about a year mm-hmm. and a half ago. Yeah. Yeah. So then last year we went up and we shut everything down in Alaska. Um, but I, I felt I wasn't done because what happened is I, the, the vision of Dave Turns Lost Mine was um, chasing that vision and trying to find old mines that we could make profitable yep. and turn them around. But the, what we did is we got cornered into the, if you find that mine, you have oh, to mine it. Okay. Well, then it became yep. Gold Rush. Yeah, You see what I'm saying? So I mined the same place for two years. It became Gold Rush, and they canceled the show. But I wanted to go back to that same idea of history, real people, and how gold has kind of changed yeah. America. I mean, because if you look if you look at the history of America, even on this side of the, the Mississippi, they came this way mm-hmm. for gold. Um, and all, a lot of the towns, I mean, you can go look at all the towns. Phoenix was gold. Denver was on gold. San Francisco Francisco was was on gold because it was, San Francisco was built on gold. Baker city, Oregon, all these towns and cities, we tend to ignore our past and our history. And I don't want to ignore it because if we look at our history and we say they made some Mm -hmm. mistakes, right? They did some things wrong, but we can do better. And so I want to put, and again, it goes back to our image. So I want to show Mm -hmm. mining and real people doing it that rely on Mm -hmm. the mining and how they're doing it right. So it's, it's, you know, that's my goal. And so that's, I'm doing a new show 
in Sweet, regards man. to that. Dude, we're really excited for it, Dave. We're excited for yeah. for everything you do and and what you highlight for us uh, in the industry. You gonna do a little fishing and whatnot? You ever gonna like slow down a little bit, do a little fishing, do any of this? Hey, I am. I am going there elk go. hunting. There you go. I'm going elk hunting. Mm. In about three weeks, we're going to go horses, Ooh. mules on in the high country cool, in Idaho. Cool. Well, we'll look forward to the pictures and uh, looking forward to uh, that. We can have you back on, and uh, you can tell us how the hunt went and, and how that goes, and and what you have going on here in the future. Because I I highly doubt uh, you 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 seem like the guy who is like us in the construction industry, who even though they're done, they're never done. Right when they when they retire, so I'm looking forward to the <laughs> yeah. books and the seminars and the speaking and stuff for a long time to come, Dave. We really, really, really appreciate you being on here. And one thing um, that I, I always kind of find ironic is that our guests, even though we don't know it, speak asphalt, and that's what we do here, right? And so it's, yeah. it's very cool that you have the tie to it with us. So. We will see you at Dirt World Summit. Dave, thank you so much for joining us here on Blacktop Banner and bringing your perspective in. Be sure, if you're listening to the podcast, to stay after we get off here for some words from our great sponsors who help bring you the show as well. And as always, for myself and for Dave Turin in rainy Oregon, we speak asphalt. Peace. Hey there, Blacktop Banner fans. This is Hayden. I am the co-founder of Spot On Sight. Uh, We're asphalt contractors ourselves. We run an asphalt paving company based out of Denver, Colorado. We know this is a game-changing app that will help you measure and mark your locations in your parking lots, document using time-stamped photos, videos, and comments, and send professional-looking reports to your customers. We have a free 14-day trial on -on spotonsiteapp.com. Hey, Jessica Lombardo with Pavex, the pavement experience, and I want to invite you all to join us in San Antonio for the first ever event. It will be held January 30th through February 1st at the Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center. We are going to have a live equipment demonstration over two days, 60 hours of educational programming, and a full trade show floor with over 75 manufacturers of equipment in the paving and pavement maintenance space. So, Please join us there, and to learn more and get yourself registered, visit www.pavexshow.com. When it comes to asphalt tools and supplies, Liberty Supply has darn near everything you need. I actually think the owner, Sam, sleeps on a mountain of spray tips in their warehouse alongside the pour pots, hot pots, steel brooms, chalk lines, flagging tape, and hundreds of other items. If you call Sam today at 800-397-9907, or visit libertysupply.biz, they'll get you set up with everything you need. For custom and multi-piece stencils, I always turn to Stencil Plus. They've supplied every stencil we use, and these things last a long time. Actually, I should probably call Jeff over at Stencil Plus and just say hi, because it's been a long time since I've had to place an order. Anyway, if you want long-lasting, high-quality stencils, head over to stencilplus.com and save 10% by using code BB10 during checkout.